State, especially if they're new to Umbraco. And I think that's going to make like, leaps and bounds forward for uh, newcomers to Umbraco. So I'm really excited to see that. We got a little glimpse of it with not only the keynote, but Stefan Stunt showed it. So I think that's what I'm most excited about. And then a feature that's underutilized. That's a tough one. Yeah, I might have to think on that. Yeah, we can go around yeah. a second time. Because that is a tough one. Just take your time, my bro. <laughs> yeah, let's just sit here for a moment and reflect. Do, 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 do. No, I'll, I'll pass on the torch, and we can circle back. OK, well, uh, a feature that I'm looking very much forward to is the uh, integrated apps uh, that you can actually uh, utilize in, uh, in the uh, each sections in a rock where it's coming in the game. I think that's going to be a major game changer. Uh, <laughs> It's like we've been talking about this. Um, then I have to say something else. So uh, I'm uh, super excited about variants, uh, but but not only because of what's shipping in 8.0, but also the possibilities it brings uh, post 8.0 uh, in terms of uh, not just uh, language variants, but potentially other types of variants. Oh, I actually have a follow-up that was in here about that exact topic. So we and mentioned the most uh, underutilized uh, feature in Umbrago, and that's our own fault, is relations. Oh, that's a, because uh, the that's UI a is crap for relations, and the APIs needs a little bit of uh, love. But the idea that you can relate any type of content to each other and uh, get those data super fast uh, is something we it could, it could do with some TLC, and then it would be a really great. Uh, a uh, feature for yeah, people doing complex products. Can I ask my variant follow-up question? Always. OK, so the question was is that we've heard a lot of talk about languages as it relates to variants. What other types of variants do we see coming with that? I mean, it seems like language is the marketed one. So. Yeah, so in 8.0, it's a pure language variant. Uh, but as uh, Stefan mentioned, the architecture is ready for other types of variants. Uh, very closely uh, related to the idea of segments or personalization. Uh, so, uh, for instance, when people do uh, responsive websites, it's usually uh, just lingo, lingo for uh, sending everything to the mobile phone and then hiding things with CSS. Uh, what could be interesting is actually the idea of serving uh, mobile optimized content, uh, where it's, it's less about generic content for all platforms, but more about what would be relevant uh, when people visit uh, from a mobile uh, device, but also based on where people come from, uh, frequency, etc. Uh, I think that's super interesting. We have lots of things we need to learn before we can do that. But, uh, then, and that's the, maybe the most underrated thing about V8 is uh, how how much awesome uh, work has gone into re-architecturing what I made earlier. <laughs> Back in the days, uh, all my stuff is gone. I do have a commit in V8. Uh, I managed to get a pull request approved this week, uh, where I changed the background photo. Uh, so I am still a contributor, uh, but the architecture of eight now is actually super clean, and it's going to make it possible for us to do a lot of the stuff uh, that we've been talking about over the last couple of years, but also iterate much faster, which is. Uh, I think just a side effect that, that nobody really realized, uh, of course, uh, but, but we will definitely see over the next uh, couple, of, uh, a couple of years. Can everyone agree on the relations being probably one of the most underutilized features? Did you have a different one? No, but I can definitely add to that. I would say that uh, we, there's a relations exercise in one of the trainings that we offer, and that's one that people are kind of I guess blown away or, or didn't even know that it was there because it's so hidden away. So when, when they can like tie into the relation service and everything, it's uh, the possibilities are in this in that line. Yeah. Good, good point. I have another two questions that came in that are somewhat similar, so I'll kind of try to group them together on the fly. Uh, how do you see how do you currently see the US market and where do you see it in five years? How do we get there? What are the plans for HQ expansion in the US? So that those two kind of go together. 
Well, I can uh, chip into that. Uh, I've been saying you know, over the last year that uh, I see some patterns here in the, in the US market that we saw in UK uh, five or six years ago. Um, so I strongly believe that uh, it is an increasing market. In the in UK, uh, we took that market and have a huge brand awareness today, uh, both from end clients, but also there's not a single .NET developer experience that has to work with a rack for some time in their career. Uh, and those patterns we saw there in UK uh, five, six years ago, we see the same patterns here. Uh, a rack was taken in by the developers looking for a flexible tool, uh, an open source .NET tool, and they were pushing it uh, through their agencies and to the end clients. I believe that's the same pattern we would see here. And US is still pretty high on downloads, correct? Like, yep. overall? Yep. Uh, plus, another pattern we are seeing in the US that we haven't seen before is uh, organizations actually requesting uh, Embargo, uh, even for new builds, uh, which is super interesting. So, in five years, I guess, uh, North America is uh, the biggest Embargo market. Now, how does that work from a people resource perspective, though? Because we've got this guy over here. And well, that is a lot more than a year ago. Hundred percent increase. No, but to actually Fair add, to add on to that as well, uh, and this is a preview of my closing tomorrow. But when I first started with Embargo, I was the support, and I was on for maybe two or three hours every other day, and that was the support. And as Paul mentioned in his talk earlier today, uh, the support on Embargo. The team that we have, it's called SWAT. They're support warriors and troubleshooters. Uh, they are, I, I think that we've got teams that stay on until it's around 9 or 10 Danish time. And so there's the support around the US community and being aware of these time zones. Is, I've seen the change since I've been uh, with the HQ. So that's really encouraging. Yeah, and uh, in our latest uh, town hall, back, uh, what, once a month at the HQ, we have town hall where we sort of share things internally, and uh, Jim, who runs the SWAT team, he said, uh, now I've been looking at the data, and it seems like uh, it makes sense that we uh, open our business hours, uh, increase our business hours late in the evening, and judging from his the reaction from his team members, he had forgotten to sort of share that information uh, before. It was quite hilarious. Yep. And uh, I think you said, what are we doing actively in this market to expand it as well? Uh, well, I don't know if you are all aware of it, but we have uh, actually here today, we have brought in our, uh, our PR agency, uh, and we are starting to actively do some public relations. We are trying to get the local media here in the States as well. Yes, and to if, uh, if Umbrago or if uh, North America is going to be the biggest Market, then obviously we're going to have uh, a lot more people uh, at the HQ that speaks better English than Hannes and I. I don't think that's a concern, honestly. Yeah. All right, so this one takes a little bit of a deviation. Uh, as VP of marketing, how would you recommend I differentiate a Braco versus other CMS options when selling it to my boss? Well, I can chip into that. Uh, first of all, VP of marketing on Braco makes you able to do your job the best way because we have the best editor experience. That's as simple as that. <laughs> and done. <laughs> Any follow up questions to that one? Uh, well, and I can actually, yeah, I can add on to that as well. Uh, as this question gets brought up pretty often. And uh, my CMS experience is mainly around Umbraco, so I'll just speak to Umbraco. And uh, it really goes back to that whole best of breed mentality. Now Umbraco might not have the marketing automation around it that other systems could have. Uh, but with that said, I've also gotten a lot of feedback from people that sometimes those fancy systems are in place, but they're not utilized. And so they're spending all these licensing fees something that they're not actually utilizing could be done in a much simpler approach 
or even using a system that they would use on Bucko that they could integrate with. So uh, it really just comes down to consideration, scope of the project. What do you what do you really need, and do you need that additional feature set, and are you going to utilize it? Yeah, and to follow up, uh, there's something called the Toyota method, which basically is uh, asking why five times. So, so when people say we need to use this because the progress is not ready, you ask why, and you do ask why again and again and again, and then you actually start having a conversation about what does the organization or the in client actually needs, uh, uh, less than what tool is relevant. Uh, Early on, before you even covered uh, what the end client uh, uh, needs, and, and when you come to that, often Umbrella can do the job, and and if not, then you know you should definitely go with something else. Uh, so, I mean, every now and then people approach us and ask uh, uh, whether they should use Umbrella or not, and, and sometimes in like in Europe, we are out helping with sales pitches, and, and every now and then we just have to say Umbrella is not a good fit. Uh, and, and that's also a nice feeling because, of course, 99 out of 100, we say, ah, progress is perfect. Uh, but, but that five why questions thing is also called having a toddler. It's called what? <laughs> having a toddler, small child. They ask why a lot. Uh, this is an interesting one. This comes from uh, Simon in the middle of nowhere. I made that up. Will there be a partner vetting program to validate a partner's skills? What about for certified developers? Hashtag asking for a friend. <laughs> vetting partners and we we have certified developers that test the vetting. I don't know. So, <laughs> young guy, we do have we do have uh, certification requirements for our partners. And uh, so that, that is the, I guess, initial answer I would say to that. And same thing for certified developers. We, uh, that's why we introduced the different levels. There's certified professional, expert, and master, that ever-elusive master level. Uh, but yeah, we use that as our way to gauge whether or not you've been given the information you need so that we would deem to uh, either recommend as an agency or to work with as, a, as an individual developer. Yeah, plus uh, with the new case studies uh, section on Umbrago, uh we're also giving partners a chance to profile their work. And uh, as far as I know, that work will also be a part of the partner profile. So in that sense, that's a motivation to sort of uh, show how experienced you are. Uh, actually uh, qualifying based on, on some, some other sorts of merits would be a very subjective uh, Approach and that's something we would be able to do. Well, I can uh, come with an, uh, an example. Uh, talking to uh, more than 200 partners over the last couple of years, uh, I usually get once in a while, we've been building on Braco sites for years. Uh, can we please show you some of our work? And uh, to be honest, uh, we can't uh, spend a lot of time looking at projects, uh, looking at code. That's why we have trainings and official certifications that prove you have a certain skill. Yeah, and then again, remember that that, that part of the requirement is only uh, one thing that makes an agency great. Um, we have super experienced uh, Bravo agencies out there that are less qualified to run projects. Uh, and in the same way you have uh, uh, agencies who might not be uh, super Umbrago experts, but they are super great at running projects. Uh, and somewhere in the middle, you find probably find the best partners. But, but I think sometimes uh, people think too one-dimensional and only thinking about. Usually, I hear this when when some developers take over another agency's project work, and they're like, "Oh, this is such a crappy implementation." Uh, often, there's a back history. Uh, uh, maybe the specs weren't good enough, uh, etc. Uh, so you can't look at the end product and assume how it got to be that way. Filed also under asking for a friend. Uh, when will V8 be released? <laughs> Can I go ahead and answer that one? Because uh, I know the answer. Yeah, I wasn't supposed to say, but November 14th, we have a huge event in. Oh, just kidding. Oh, I thought it was when it's ready. It's when it's ready. This is 
actually an interesting related, but not exactly related. Will there be any more versions before eight? Like, are we at a feature freeze on seven for right now? I added that end part. That, I'm assuming that's what they're talking about. Like, will there be any more seven dot releases? So the last uh, three releases of uh, minor releases of seven uh, has been more or less community driven. There's actually new features in them. Uh, and while uh, the core team of Umbrago doesn't do direct work on 7, uh, we do have uh, full-time staff uh, working with qualifying the uh, pull, pull requests and the core team also helps with reviewing the pull requests, but all focus uh, for a while uh, in terms of uh, HQ developers have been on Umbrago 8. Uh, I believe Plus minus that uh, what seven is right now, and mind you, seven is awesome. Um, it's uh, it's pretty much the best seven can be right now. Uh, of course, we can always have a little polish here and there, but but yeah, I uh, I think uh, 2019 it's uh, full on me. What you said? <laughs> I'll shut up. No, no, that was great. Um, can you share where, and I, I've heard this one a lot, can you share where .NET Core fits in with Abraco? Any advantage to going that way? Question mark. Well, that'll be the thing. Niels probably has more to say on this than I do, but uh, the, when Headless starts becoming, uh, I guess, more developed, that'll be a great instance for that. Somebody that is not on the .NET side of things will be able to work with Abraco and use the back office. And then or I guess essentially it won't have to be tied into the uh, done in some things. Um, I, I eventually uh, Brian will be the Nipco. Uh, a, a big part of our DNA is also that we're curious. Uh, also have a curious community, and and if we don't, uh, if, if we don't continue to use uh, modern technology, eventually why will be boring. That said, the the primary reasons right now to go with our new call is because it's super performant. Uh, but I don't think that's the biggest issue for most of our sites right now, uh, performance. Uh, longer down the road, it's, there's a lot of advantages, of course. Um, on the, the new call, I would say, uh, I think three years ago, we were at Microsoft for, or we had people at Microsoft for, uh, for a couple of days to help architecture, uh, architect uh, Umbrago for the net core. And since uh, the net core has been through three architecture iterations, so I'm kind of relieved that we didn't go that way. Uh, but of course, uh, the net core is on, on our radar. Uh, we don't know when. Uh, but as Andrew mentioned, uh, and as we see, uh, actually, uh, earlier uh, this month, uh, the official website for the for the Danish Olympic athletes uh, launched, and that was a that was a done in core project using Bragu uh, as a hit the so, Even though you know, even though the back office uh, or Bragu as such isn't isn't ready, you can easily have a done uh, in core based rendering it if it's super important for you for whatever reason. Who are some of your, and then Umbraco's and parentheses, who are some of Umbraco's most notable customers? So I guess that would be the agencies that develop solutions, kind of similar to one of your slides. It's like Heinz. Well, uh, I would say all, all the ones using Umbraco is, uh, is uh, important customers. Uh, there is uh, multiple perspectives on this. Uh, one is uh, financial. Uh, another one would be uh, contributors. Uh, a third one would be uh, uh, lighthouses out there. Uh, it's hard to say who's the the best one of these, but obviously we like the one that interact with us, that makes us better, and also, of course, makes us sustainable. 
Okay, I blew it as moderator because I should have read the follow-up a little more thoroughly because this would probably help frame the answers better. If you had to sell Umbraco to my boss, what would you say? Why Umbraco and three to four reasons? So this is a, why can't we be like these big boys and use Umbraco? Big people, sorry. So you want the selling points of Umbraco? Uh... I mean, uh, editor experience is uh, one of the great things. Ecosystem, uh, flexibility, uh, that probably nine out of 10, uh, Brago actually does what you want, uh, more or less out of the box. And in the last 10% of the cases, it's very likely that you can make it, uh, you can tailor it to, uh, to the needs you have. Uh, then of course, the strong ecosystem uh, our great history uh, and our pretty uh, cool and bold vision, I think, are moving, moving forward. Uh, it, it's, it, it sounds so boring to say, but I'm probably such a safe choice now. But, uh, you know, it used to be, we used to be weird and edgy and kind of funny and crazy. And, uh, but I think, uh, I still think we're, yes, now I get to say the F word. I haven't said the F word yet. We're still a little bit. Oh, please just get it out. Oh, thank you. Oh, <laughs> it felt so good. I'm not allowed to go on Microsoft podcast anymore because I I said fuck twice <laughs> on live Microsoft podcast, so they don't want me back. Is it still out there? Because it was an epic. <laughs> it was almost almost as epic as when the uh, guy looked weird at me and I said, "I'm European. I'm allowed to." <laughs> That was 10 years ago, I was much younger. But no, but uh, I mean, if you look at the HQ, if you look at our partner ecosystem, everything has sort of uh, matured while not, while still daring to be bold and curious. So while Brago might have been more of a crazy choice in the old days, it's, you know, it's the most widespread on the, uh, the net stack. Um, Microsoft uses it. Um, yeah, so many, so many big customers are, are using it, and and there's so much knowledge out there, and such an active community. So, I, it, it feels so stupid because that was exactly what people said about the other systems ten years ago when we were a challenger, and it was so frustrating to hear about it because you know, that's your past. What are your future? But I actually still think that we have a a super visionary future. Uh, so, yeah. And to add on to that too, the, the culture I, again. I, I've only been around since late 2013, maybe started 2014. A lot of you have been here longer than me, but just with the growth that has happened, either in the community or at the HQ, the fact that the culture has remained the same, I think that's pretty unique to the company. So that's, even though all the stability is coming on the, uh, on the actual, I guess, well, even more stability on the software side of things, and, and even as a, uh, as a company, the fact that the culture is remaining is, I think it speaks volumes. Maybe our, our biggest disadvantage is our Scandinavian roots. So as a Scandinavian, you don't brag. Uh, so in fact, the the biggest beer brand in Scandinavia has the tagline, probably the best beer in the world. Uh, and I, I, that might be a problem for us uh, in, in some other places, maybe here, uh, that we, we don't shout too much. But if you actually look over the last couple of years, we've actually delivered uh, what we promised, uh, and, and we've been completely transparent about where we want to head. May I layer some personal experience to the answer? So I've been in that position to sell whatever we're going to qualify in Brocco as to my boss. And it really doesn't matter what large companies are utilizing it as a product because I've seen large companies screw it up. And I've seen small companies screw it up, and I've seen small companies make an amazing end result, and big companies do the same. The cool thing about this product is we download it, and we, as developers in the community, we make it what it is for our customers. So the parent behind it that develops it, yes, they're going to be with us and partner with us and help us get it out there into the world, but ultimately, the outcome of the experience is on us. So. When selling it to your boss, you might have to inject that kind of ego and also layer on top of that, because of the way this product is built, I can make this a great experience for our customers. That's just my personal thing.
Uh, plus, um, while Umbrago might be a dictatorship um, uh, in the way it's run, uh, I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> no, but I, I'm, I'm very proud that uh, that Umbrago is actually uh, it's it's opinionated. Uh, it has stewardship, uh, and sometimes people can disagree with that stewardship, and sometimes we're challenged, uh, and of course sometimes we make mistakes. But the great thing about open source is that if we truly fucked up, and if we truly went, uh, let's say for some reason, when we lost cloud, everybody was, oh, not everybody, a lot of people were paranoid, are you not gonna be open source anymore? But the cool thing about open source is, if we were really disloyal to our ecosystem, it's, it, it doesn't have the overhead of democracy where there needed to be a election and maybe someone could be elected. You could just, you know, the population could just take the entire country and run it uh, and just say, you know, uh, fuck you to the dictator. Uh, and that's, I think that's a, such an underrated um, uh, insurance in a well-run open source project. Uh, we're not evil, we don't have investors, we're, we're a, a sustainable company, uh, we've been around for a long time, we, we're behaving. Uh, but if some, somehow we stop behaving well, uh, you know, there would be that uh, escape plan uh, for, the, for the community that they could actually take the product and, you know, take it in another direction. For a second, I had no idea where you're taking that, but that would be a big boss concern, is like, what happens if this community goes south? Gotcha. That is important to add. So you get the best of both worlds. Um, wow. All right, so that actually went deep. Uh, here's another question that is not quite as deep. Are there any plans for a search product from the HQ similar to Umbraco Forms? Nope. <laughs> and there you have it. In fact, we're shipping eight with a better search engine of box. And yes, there are plans. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's... Integrated and not an yeah. add-on product. Gotcha. And that probably negates because this is a related question about. Well, actually, no. This is interesting. Do you feel that forms has caught up to the level of completeness as the rest of the core? <coughs> no, quite the contrary. Um, in fact, there are so many possibilities uh, and perspectives in forms. Uh, so I think people feel like we're neglecting uh, forms. It's a bandwidth question. Uh, we really want to get Bravo 8 out, and uh, once we've done that, we have some pretty, pretty insane and bold ideas for forms, especially in terms of setting digital tiers free. Uh, which is, I don't know any of that. <laughs> uh, which I think is going to be super interesting. Yeah, so I think as a as a form builder, uh, it's not really that interesting it, uh, if. Uh, no form tool is interesting. Uh, just as a just as a native form builder, what's actually interesting, if you look at the perspective of a form builder, is the ability to get some data and do something with it. And that's where we that was the original vision of forms, and then it sort of died in uh, just the, the general growing pains of, of running Broadway and, and maybe we were trying to do too much. Uh, but but the plans for forms moving forward is. Uh, Super interesting in terms of you know the mission of democratizing digital business. So I am done with cards, but did any of those cards inspire, or any of the answers inspire any additional questions from anyone out there? I thought I saw some hands possibly flinching when I said that. Anyone have a question that they would like to ask the panel since we have them here? Ooh. Oh, there we go. Thank you. We're what's between this and the, the free bar, right? So, uh, Rocker Cloud and V8, when will V8 be on the right, right away? Or yep, the moment, uh, the moment V8 is released, you can use it on cloud. Yep. Including full deploy support and everything. My understanding uh, for pull requests is they get added um, sorted by uh, the last ones in or at the top, and uh, they're handled that way. So if you have your pull request in and it, it's waiting at the bottom, um, the 
I guess, can you, can you clarify what the process is for uh, merging in pull requests once they're approved? Like they're in the approved category, who decides and how, when they get merged in? Um, that's, a, that's a super cool question. What, what we did uh, around CodeGuard was we changed the process for pull requests yeah. um, because they have been piling up too long. So now we have the initial filter where we have a PR team that qualifies pull requests uh, first, uh, and then from there the uh, the D team, which is the development team at uh, HQ, takes over. And usually in the order where they come in, of course some some pull requests are more complex uh, than others, uh, and some of them might be easy technically, but maybe complex from a UX perspective, uh, which is why they go into rework or uh, at the HQ, we also need to think. Uh, one of the things we've been really bad at in the past was giving too fast, too direct, and maybe too candid feedback on PRs, uh, where it could seem like we didn't respect the work that people have put into it. So sometimes if there's a very complex uh, pull request coming in that, for instance, doesn't follow what we believe is great UX, we don't reply immediately. Uh, but we do some internal discussions and try to see if we can motivate uh, and, and give great feedback for that PR on how it could be improved. Uh, that said, if you look at PRs both for core and for documentation, uh, since Coca, uh, the I can't remember the stats exactly, but it's uh, uh, there were some policies around that people should have a reply within uh, 24 hours and then a a more detailed reply within, I think it was uh, 72 hours, and we've delivered on that promise. Uh, and I think we've, I can't remember the numbers, but we are below 100 uh, pending pull requests, including the very old ones. And all pull requests that came in since May, uh, have, we've lived up to the promise that we, that we gave. I don't know if that answers your question. It's, in general, uh, we, we merge them in the order they come in, but of course if there's and it's not low hanging fruit, but if there's something very simple, uh, you can you know fast forward it, and it might seem like uh, if you have a more complex thing that you get ne neglected. But it's you should more take it as uh, we take the PR very seriously, just like we take the quality of the product seriously. Anyone else? Nope. Uh, it's completely rewritten to native JavaScript. No, just kidding. Uh, it's still Angular. Uh, latest Angular 1 point something, which might freak people out, but uh, Angular 1x is still uh, super awesome for what the product is. Uh, the learning curve is much smaller uh, than the later Angular releases. Uh, and, and basically, if we look at it from a straight, uh, if you should, uh, if you should, if you should reason why we would spend energy on, on a completely new front-end uh, platform, uh, it's very hard to justify moving from, from Angular 1x. Not saying that we won't eventually, uh, but it's, it's, it's not an area right now. Kind of similar to the question that was asked by your kind of the underloved feature in the core. There was one thing you could remove from the core CMS, maybe a decision that you made that you'd like to backtrack on. What would it be? Kellen yeah, White hosted you coffee. You brought on brought coffee. <laughs> uh, I think models builder was a huge mistake. Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> apart from XSLT, uh, the translation part, but that's also uh, removed now. Uh, it was, uh, I believe it's the only truly half-assed feature in, uh, in a browser that it wouldn't have made the cut to
the softball one is it sounds like there is no translation for fluid only. Is that correct? Correct. In fact, uh, V8 is full of compromises. Uh, it's been one of the most fascinating processes because we have a track record of saying yes to everything and then turn things into a, uh, epic or internal projects. One thing that we actually try with 8.0 is saying no to a lot of things. So uh, in 8 out of the box, for instance, there's no permissions for multilingual. Uh, just like there isn't in 7. So if people use Bordeaux on 7, there's no permissions either. So we figured, okay, we're going to skip that one. The same with the translation workflow. But as with anything in Umbrago, there's events uh, for everything. So it would be uh, possible for the community to create a, a translation workflow that actually makes sense. Uh, because uh, I love the confidence that the community puts into the HQ, but there's so many things we don't know anything about. And what I found fascinating with the EU project, for instance, was how experienced they were in uh, how translation works in real life. And one thing where that would really benefit Umbrago in the, is when uh, people with uh, very specific domain knowledge in the community steps up uh, and, and actually shows us uh, what would the right uh, way to do this, uh, or how would that be. But, uh, I mean, eight is uh, is super fast. Like, I, in some areas, it's a it's a step backwards uh, from seven, but in so many other areas, it's a huge leap forward. Uh, but remember, the moment we ship eight zero, we can work on eight one, eight two, eight three, uh, which is so much more fun than keep being almost done with the release. Uh, so. uh, thank you. And, and then the other question is less. But it's just more looking at the future of the product, the core product, like way beyond like is it not core laser? What is this thing? And what what is your vision for the dot future in the product? Uh, in specifics, I don't. Yeah, not specifically. Just like what, if you could dream what it would be, not specifically not technology wise, but just what it could be at some point in the future. What, what's the then it would be that it's uh, as easy for someone responsible for the digital business part uh, in, in an organization to, to do that as it is to create, to uh, edit content right now. So we can use uh, developers, which there will only be fewer of uh, in the future to actually create amazing, uh, amazing stuff rather than a lot of developers doing relatively boring integrations. To be honest, uh, I think developers should. Uh, first of all, I don't think software engineers should build web websites, but that's a very opinionated thing. Uh, I think, I guess you could call them either Umbrago developers or technicians, uh, made in the most uh, positive way. And then I think software engineers should do uh, what software engineers do very well: uh, engineer software. Uh, so I hope uh, that we will be able to. Uh, enable technicians or, or browser developers to do even more things, all while a lot of the things that requires a browser developer today uh, would would just be possible using the, the UI for a uh, for a digital marketer. So, say that I'm a marketer and I I need to launch a campaign, I could just do that without asking anyone, uh, and it would just scale. Uh, I could put it where I, it's relevant in the world. Uh, and when I need to collect data, I can just do that. And if that data needs to go into whatever platform we use, as long as they have a connector to Umbraco, I can just pick that. Uh, you know, data style, just like when you say, do you want to allow Google to access uh, whatever, the editor could do that. Um, and, and then the data would flow uh, from the website into their Salesforce system or whatever. I, I have this sentence that annoy people in the HQ, which is, uh, can it be done in an evening? Uh, one day, I think that would be awesome. If you have a great friend, they want to do something online, and you can just say, sure, do you have an evening? Then we can get it done. And of course, once that's possible in an evening, it means that what a, an umbrella agency can do in, 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 in a project or in months is, is mind-blowing. 
it doesn't mean that we're going to take work away from, from others. But I think digital biotech deserves to be free and not relying on, on people uh, to do that job. Anyone else? Oh, here we go. Speechly. What's the one thing that you found most surprising? What's surprising? What's the most surprising thing you found in a random jobs websites being developed? You're asking what has been the most surprising in the market, right? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, I think I mentioned it uh, in my talk. Uh, first time I met with the, the community, the vibe, the, uh, the atmosphere around uh, this community, this friendliness, uh, absolutely amazing and overwhelming for me. Very surprising. And also, a little bit scary. Yeah, and I mean, I would say community too. It's crazy that uh, it, Umbrago is still a piece of software, and there are plenty of pieces of software that I have. Well, and, and I'm just the CMS part of it. But it's what's around that, and it's the community that we have. Uh, it's also just mind blowing to be able to travel around and and have these different relationships with people around, like you know, the U.S. or even in Europe, and then we all get together, and it's like we haven't skipped a beat. So it's uh, it's very unique in that sense. I'd say uh, the amount of incredible, stupid things that we've been allowed to do at Umbrago Pingo, <laughs> while people will still talk to us. I would have to say it's the people thing too, just from jumping in. Give him my opinion here again, because I don't go to conferences with my PowerPoint friends and hang out until one in the morning and have deep, meaningful conversations and do it for three days on end. So I think there's definitely something unique with this piece of software that doesn't really exist in a lot of places. There's one other thing uh, that was actually from US Fest in Orlando, or the day after uh, US Fest in Orlando. Uh, my wife and I took uh, the honeymoon we never got to take. So we were sitting in a car and we were about to drive to Key West and uh, a guy uh, came knocking on the door of the car and he was smiling while showing his uh, slightly bleeding leg and saying, I love Umbrago so much that I got a tattoo. And just the expression on my wife's face while she said, what have you done? <laughs> is uh, one, of the, one of the best things, or well, surprising things. This is one for everyone, but maybe most of the others. On the Unicorner, you ask members of HQ for a friendly and a hungry. I want to ask you the same question. For the community, what's one thing you love, one thing that we could do better? Yep, uh, so for those who don't know, the Unicorner uh, friendly is a tip uh, on how to use a product that I ask uh, employees, and hungry is if they were in my chair, what would they do? Um, uh, friendly, uh, it would just uh, you know keep doing uh, what you're doing. Uh, it's I can't say how privileged it is to wake up in the morning and just see all the things that's been happening while I've been asleep, uh, all the crazy things that people do. And for the hungry part, um, we have this uh, sentence. Uh, uh, or this value called trust, and under the if trust, we say a super positive intent. And I just think that everybody should do that. Uh, we are so many different people, so many different cultures, a lot of things in the Umbrago ecosystem happens um, in written writing. And I think we as humans have a tendency to believe the worst of other people. And I think if we all just uh, assume positive intent, I think a lot of uh, energy could have could be spent uh, much more constructive uh, than it sometimes is. Yeah, and uh, I was going to say just the one thing. Well, and, and this isn't even do better because it's already I think done pretty.
pretty well. I just want to even encourage it more. If there's something that you are curious about or want to see changed, then just keep asking or like start threads around it because others might be having the same uh, question. The amount of times I get asked the same question around a specific topic. Like I know one that came up today was I think uh, where workflows are stored in forms or something like that. Somebody mentioned that. I've heard that one a couple of times. And so just bringing those things up and, and talking about them and that communication. What Niels was saying at the in, in the keynote today, the I, I forget the exact phrasing, but it's like knowledge is in the community. That's uh, that's really the best way to start indicating what has to be prioritized. So I think that's already done really well. I just want to encourage it more because I think that's important. Uh, and then remember that uh, people in the HQ is just like you, uh, and sometimes we're in a hurry as well. Uh, sometimes we do knee-jerk uh, reactions as well. Uh, and again, if you're assume positive intent, maybe just ask the day after, uh, do you still think this, or could you ask someone else to look at, uh, at what I wrote? Because uh, uh, like everybody else, if you have deadlines and, and stressful days as well, and then sometimes what we, what we say come up can come across arrogant and, and when you are at the HQ, you really don't think about the authority that we have because you know we just random people as well. So my question is kind of a two-parter. Um, from a develop development standpoint, and then also the marketing standpoint, what do you guys see as like biggest obstacles for for a rocker moving forward? That was a good question. <laughs> Development standpoint, I would probably say bandwidth, because there's plenty of opportunity and, and ideas that we want to implement. It's just a matter of having enough people and resources to get that done, which is also why the community is obviously such a massive part of it. The last three, seven releases have all been community driven, which is pretty awesome. But yeah, I would say, at least from my perspective, to, uh, resources is from a development standpoint. And uh, from a marketing standpoint, I can see that there's a lot of the, how can I put it, the bigger competitors that have unlimited resources and foundings that they can push marketing much harder to end clients than we can. We can't do that. That's where the community and our partners come in, uh, in house. That might be one of the biggest obstacles uh, for us uh, on the marketing side. Yeah, if, if you look at the, uh, if you look at, uh, I guess, three of our biggest competitors, they've all had uh, $250 million plus uh, VC investments uh, or uh, have been acquired by, on, on billion dollar evaluations. Uh, or valuations. Um, obviously, we insist on being bootstrapped and that has a lot of advantages in terms of knowing uh, the, you know, the only people we, we are accountable uh, for is our community and our ecosystem. On the flip side, it, it, of course, it means that you know our funds is limited. Uh, we can't do uh, you know nationwide uh, advertisement campaigns, uh, etc. Uh, and of course, sometimes you just wish we could do that. Uh, just like sometimes you just wish we could hire uh, 100 developers, but but but. Then on the other side, when you see the the decision that some of our competitors take, I'm uh, I just I'm super happy that we're not in, in their shoes. So I'm just interested if uh, you guys could say like who you who are your role models or like what do you read or like what keeps you inspired? Maybe that goes for the whole company of HQ, but like specifically you three, that'd be good. Yeah. Uh, Leadership, uh, Simon Sinek, uh, obviously a huge inspiration. The same with a Chicago-based company uh, called Basecamp. Uh, uh, Jason Fried and, and a Danish guy uh, who co-founded it called David Heinemeyer Hansen. Uh, I really think they're a huge inspiration. Actually, ever since the early days of Cobraco in terms of Creating a bootstrapped company uh, with solid values and and Obrago hasn't been built to flip, uh, so that are that are really a massive massive uh, 
uh, rogue ones for me. Uh, and I think, especially the base camp, uh, people they just keep surprising. They just released a new book called It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work. Uh, when you read it as a day, half of it is totally obvious. And you're like, what? Why would anyone work 60 hour weeks uh, and not have six weeks of paid vacation? Uh, but apparently that's not common over here. Uh, I would encourage everybody to read it. It takes two hours to read. It's a uh, Kindle, Audible, whatever. It's a it's a really good book. Called it doesn't have to be crazy. And uh, I have a colleague called uh, Kim Sneel. He can drink more bourbon than any other person that I know. <laughs> what is that really your criteria for robot? <laughs> One of them. Others. Uh, this one. This one goes way back, but it's like a video that I watched in Earl Nightingale. Anybody? Does that name ring a bell? Okay. It's like this 30-minute audio thing of this guy. I think he's from like the 1950s or 60s. I'm not sure, but anyway, it's kind of. I think it's a play off of one of the like, seven habits of highly effective people or something. But it's just a nice little refresher every so often. It's the whole like uh, you become what you think about. Really set a goal. If, if you don't have a goal, what are you, what are you steering towards? That sort of thing, that mindset. So it's a nice little clip and steers me in the right direction. So I'd say that's a motivational one or, or inspirational one. Speaking up on that magical hour mark, uh, any last questions? We could finish with one more, or we could actually look at that inspirational one as a good finisher. I just want to say thanks to everyone who submitted questions. I thought that was a very well-rounded approach for these three. I'll see you soon if they agree or not. But I think it was some great conversation. And the cool thing about a conference is, if you want to learn more from these people, you can actually walk up to them in the next couple of minutes and share a beverage or not and ask questions that maybe would be off the beaten path because they would probably love to answer them. So do you want to end with anything else, you guys? No. What, uh, the the clever oracle of Umbrago, aka Bob Fady Bassett, uh, except not only minutes, but also hours, and of course tomorrow's, tomorrow as well. Uh, it's why we're here, we love talking to you. Uh, and that's, uh, whatever conversation we have with you is actually what uh, forms uh, the product when we get home. So this is your chance and our chance uh, to create a, a better Umbrago uh, in the future. Thanks. Oh, there we go. Uh, Want to give a big round of applause to Bob Baby Bar for moderating, and to our friends at Umbrago HQ for coming all the way here.